Hello, and welcome back to the uh, Game Bet Match podcast. I'm your host, Manny Friedman, along with my co-host, Brad Sloan. All right, back in the house, baby, for uh, the end of Eastbourne and Mallorca and uh, the start of Wimbledon, which is going to be a great two weeks, um, jam-packed with pods. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, we should probably start there, right? So in terms of the schedule, um, tonight's pod, uh, kind of the rundown, this is a little bit of a different kind of pod. So if you're looking for picks and things, there won't be as much of that on this one. Um, we'll talk about, we'll recap quarters and semis or whatever semis were played in Eastbourne and uh, Mallorca. Mm-hmm. We'll talk uh, briefly about the matches remaining in those tournaments, um, which isn't much, I mean, obviously those in the semis and final stages. Um, then we're going to go through our power rankings. We'll do a fun segment at the, at the end called Wordplay, where I give man, you know, where we give each other a word or a player's name, and we we think of a, a brief sentence to describe them. Uh, but it's a little bit more of these kind of goofy, fun segments tonight. Could be interesting if you're into that. If you're not into it, um, then maybe this isn't the one for you. And I say that because in terms of the schedule, uh, tomorrow is going to be a megapod. So tomorrow we're going to do draws, um, and we're going to do. Uh, we're going to preview, you know, we won't go in depth into every single match, but we will talk briefly at least about all 64 first round matches. Um, so that'll be a long one. I'm thinking it'll probably be like four hours. It'll be, it'll be a long one guys. Um, and then that's Saturday, Monday, we'll probably do something Monday, um, either Monday or Tuesday. We're looking at, at doing a spaces. We'll announce the date on the Twitter. Um, we're looking at, you know, we did a, we did a spaces, I think, what, for the finals of Queens Club or semis of Queens yeah, Club semis in Halle. Halle. And yeah. that was a lot of fun. Um, so we're going to we're gonna do that again for first round of Wimbledon. Um, and then we'll probably do a pod, one pod per round mm-hmm. um, of, nice of Wimbledon. So it's going to be a hectic, busy, busy week, especially the first week coming up. I mean, as you guys know, right, there's more matches the first week. So, so it gets super busy. Second mm-hmm. week, it calms down a little bit. Just there's not as many matches. That's more props. Right, more. Yeah, there's more. Yeah, it's a little bit more like diving yeah. deep into like the guys that are still in. You can kind of really like, kind of dive deep, right? So it's more in depth talk and stuff, right? So it's yeah, it's, it's a different feel, but they're both great in their own way. Um, I feel like we're gonna do a Twitter Spaces uh, next weekend for like third and fourth round. I think that would be a lot of fun because like we can kind of focus in on less matches right so i think it will be better well i actually think you know, i was thinking about this man like i don't think it's gonna be as bad even for the first round because like there will only be like there's only I mean, there's only 32 matches on a given day which means you're only looking at like six to eight being on at a time so it's not as like chaotic True. as it sounds like it sounds ridiculous but it's really not as bad as it sounds because we're only following atp there'll be almost there'll be yeah, a little to zero women's talk. I don't so. know. For me, I tend to be overwhelmed in first round of slams. Like, I personally don't like attending them because, like, I feel like instead of watching the tennis, I'm on my phone half the time just checking scores. You know, so I, yeah, I, I, for me, second and third round are the the best. Like, those are my favorite. Just because yeah, that's how they're staggered. So if they get a staggering right, there's only like six to eight on at a time. Yeah, I think it's more like manageable. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, it will be fun. I mean, Twitter spaces will also be good because, like, you can kind of, if you're watching something else, you can, like, kind of point out something that's Well, that's what we'll try to do. We'll try to focus on different matches. That's what, that's what we did for Holly. I think you had mostly Queens Club on and I had mostly Holly. So, like, that worked, that right. worked out well. Right. Um, yeah. So, we'll probably do something similar there. Okay. Sounds good. Um, So, let, let's get right into it. Um, yeah. So, do you want to start in Eastbourne or Mallorca? Oh, uh, we can start in Mallorca. All right. Um, so my Orca quarters, um, Harris over Kotov, uh, Hoffman ended Feliciano Lopez's career two and four. Um, Eubanks beat Rinderneck in two tie breaks, and Manorino came, had an amazing first set. He came, he came back from two five, love 40 down in the first set, uh, mm-hmm. to beat Mute five and two. Yeah. Um, you and I both have futures on Manorino, I think at 650. Those are looking oh, we, fantastic. We've... Absolutely um, great. Uh, we also had futures on him to win the quarter at uh, um, even and money. even money. So right? that, that, was, you that was terrific too. Yeah, because like we looked at that that part of the draw, and it's like who the hell was there? I mean, regardless of that, regardless of that part of the draw, this whole draw was <laughs> like there really wasn't like there wasn't a whole lot there in terms of guys who you're really going to believe in. Like going back to the yeah. seeds, man. The seeds were Sitsipas, so we know you know we, we've talked enough about him. Mm-hmm. Kokina, who's a great candidate to go out early on grass and, and an even better candidate the week before a slam. Um, Shelton, who we know, I mean, we know the deal with Shelton. He's still super erratic. Yeah. Um, Manorino, Gasquet, 
Zapata, um, and RCB. So RCB and Zapata are clay guys. Gasquet is, you know, I mean, we know we know who Gasquet is at this point. I mean, he's a he's still a pro, but he's you know he's he's getting up there in age. Point is, like, there it wasn't he wasn't the strongest. Draw. It was it was a weak draw and to get Manorino plus six fifty, who I think is probably the best grass court player on the in this in this field. Um, I completely might, agree. The, the fact that he might he might he's definitely the best grass court player. He might be the best tennis player. Period. At his age, like maybe not, but like the fact that you're even putting him in the top three in that category, like in that category, like just speaks to how weak this field is. Yeah, it's a weak field. You know, it's, it's a weak, weak field. field. So, um, and I don't know. I mean, like we can start with the Mute match. Like Mute is just a fucking clown. He's such yeah. like totally. Yeah. I mean, I actually think he's quite talented, and like he was kind of getting under uh, Monterey's skin, like in the first, I would say, seven games of that that set, and he was just getting everything back, right? Slicing yeah. everything deep and kind of. And Monterino was flexing his leg, his knee a little bit. Like, like I thought, I thought we were done because like Mute was actually making it physical. Yeah. And as soon as Mute started missing balls and got and Monterino got the first break back, like it was pretty much over because he just got so frustrated and started smashing rackets and verbal yeah. slurs and like just a total clown, just like just so immature, you know. And it's yeah, it's, yeah. It's like, but that's the story of Mute. Like, it's not surprising. No, it's not. It's not. But I mean, I was happy that happened. But like the first seven games, I was like, "This, this is terrible." Like we're gonna, we're gonna lose both futures. Yeah. So, um. Yeah. I mean, so that was that match. Um. Let's talk a little bit about, about Feliciano Lopez. I, I know you, uh, you know, were pumped to see that like uh, ceremony right at the end. And, I like, just, I mean, man, I like Lopez, man. You know, like yeah. it's a. Uh, I, I was kind of annoyed because, um. Tony they all said like, oh, you always did like your own way with elegance and yeah, you know, and like he almost made it sound like he could have been like better if not. But like honestly, man, like Lopez had a really good career. Mm-hmm. Like it's a really, really, it's just a, he, like it's a really good career. Like he he made top. I mean, it's amazing. He he made uh top fifteen in the world. He cracked he, his his career high ranking was twelve. Um, he's got seven titles, which is amazing. And you know, you, like you don't even realize that. Right. Um, trying to look at what his titles were, but yeah, but seven titles, um, Davis Cup champion. Like, I mean, really, really. I mean, for me, the thing he gets the most credit for, or deserves the most credit for, is having the most uh, consecutive Grand Slam appearances of anyone. Yeah. How many? What? What was it? I think from two thousand two. Until 2022, he made, he, play, he played in every slam for 20 I know, years. I know I Federer is second. Yeah, I think it's I think it's 80 consecutive slams he played in. Um, O2 French until 2022. Um, Wimbledon he played in every slam. I mean that's yeah it's 70 that's 20 years 79 is the record and he holds it. So yeah, I mean, twenty years of not missing a slam. I mean, that shows how durable you are. That shows how yeah, kind of professional you take this. How um, how you treat the sport. You know how professionally you yeah. take it. How well you treat your body. I mean, all that kind of stuff is tied into that record, and that's an extremely impressive record to have on your resume because that's very very difficult to to break. Like even for Djokovic or you know someone like that because like Djokovic even got injured in like between I think 16 and 17 right and he had to miss yeah no no I mean yeah you get injured and that's it like it's it's, I mean it's 79 that's 20 consecutive years of um of yeah and like you know it's crazy never any drama never any like yeah I mean never any any like never any any, I mean, like nothing except just like solid tennis play, right? And it was just, and, and it's amazing that I did that who couldn't hit a topspin backhand. Yep. It's also amazing that I'm looking at his uh, his uh, picture right now on a tennis abstract, and it has him winding up for a backhand. I think. <laughs> well, he has a great backhand slice, 
So I think oh, that, and it's amazing, know. like chipping it and dinking it and like doing different stuff with it. Yeah, a hundred percent. It's just funny because like yeah, the right he he didn't. I mean, his backhand drive was like comically bad. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, got to give the guy credit, man. Yeah. So one match I I really remember of his that he actually lost, but that was uh, a match I really enjoyed was the U.S. Open quarterfinal that he played against Djokovic. Uh, I don't know if you remembered, but it was seven six in the fourth. Okay. And it was it may have been one of Djokovic's toughest. Oh, I, I remember that. I do remember that match now. Yeah, I think it was a night um, match, right? It was a night match. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Like no one kind of expected it to be that competitive because like. You know, Djokovic is the greatest returner of all time. Yeah. Like the, the matchup doesn't really fit style, you know, stylistically for Lopez, but he really dug in and he played an exceptional match tactically. And yeah. he forced it to seven, six in the in the fourth and was very close to pushing it to five. So that, that was a match I was I was very enjoying. And that was like the latter part of his career. It yeah. was, yeah. That was, that match was pretty, pretty recent. But I mean, there's just right. yeah, it's cool because like he's somebody who I remember like watching actually growing up. Right. Like even back in like the mid two thousands and like he was like a solid player for so long. Like he was always what? like he was always like between like ranked between like twenty and fifty. Like it yeah. felt like his whole career. Yeah. yeah. But a lot of guys they find a way to taper off, right? And like have to play challengers for a couple of years to get their ranking back. Like he never had to do that because Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I feel like a lot it just it's just, like most guys just don't have primes for very long. Like that, that's the amazing thing. He, I mean, he was able to extend his prime for essentially 20 years. I think like that's the, right. that's the marvel of Lopez. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. Incredible, incredible yeah. doubles player too. Yeah. Good doubles, solid doubles player as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I think he won Queens like at the very end, like uh, in 2020. In 2019. 2019. 2019 he won Queens. And yeah. he won the singles and the doubles there. He did that year. Yeah. So yeah, yeah that was a crazy run. So yeah. And I mean, and it's, it's cool. It's cool. It's cool to see these old guys like get it up for that last run, you know, and like, you know, play because he played, you know, decent against Purcell, played a solid, you know, match against Thompson. Somehow, I can't believe he, I still can't believe he won that match against Thompson. And then he was just gashed for that hump. I mean, I yeah. think I talked about like the first, by, by game one, you knew that match was over. By the time he like came out right. to play the first couple of points, it was like, yeah, this is. Well, I called that match perfectly. Minus three. You did. You did. I, 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 I kind of knew it, but I, just, I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to bet against Lopez in his last match. Like, <laughs> uh, just yeah. got too much love for the guy, but yeah, I mean, I put three units on that. I was so like, confident. I can't believe that Lo- that he actually that Lopez actually won a clay title in his career. Which one was that? Uh, Gustad in twenty sixteen. Oh wow, okay, and that was towards the end of his career too, like in the second I mean, half of it. second half of his career, yeah. right? Like that's the thing. Like he was still a solid player. I know, like for yeah, maybe fourteen through sixteen were some of his better years. That's that's the thing. Like oh. his mid thirties, he was still fine. Like he wasn't like. Right. It wasn't like he was like a suddenly way worse player. Like the past year or two, yeah, he he tailed off badly. I would say, you yeah. know what I mean. Like honestly, I was I wouldn't say even then. I would say like he started to tail off somewhat badly. Like maybe starting in like eighteen, like right before COVID, he started mm-hmm. to tail. But like, but he was still like he won the Queens Club, so that kind of extended things out a little bit for him. But like, I don't know. I would say that like, but yeah, I mean, he was well into his well into his mid thirties. He was a yeah. Pretty Solid close to his prime. Yeah. Also, and, just his style, right? Like the serve and volley style, like the slice style. Like, like you've seen, like, like you even in the early two thousands, you saw more different styles. Yeah. And that's basically gone now. Like everybody basically is the same style. Like there's there's minor differences, but like when we talk about different styles now, we're talking about like okay, this guy plays like a little more defensively. This guy plays a little more offensively. Mm-hmm. But for like eighty percent of the tour, it's pretty subtle. And like Lopez was like truly different. But even this week, like, I feel like he played pretty well. Like, I feel like he's playing better than, say, Shapovalov. I mean, most people are, I guess, right? But, like, I felt like he played above a challenger level of tennis this week. Uh, Yeah, maybe. the first two matches he played decently well. I mean, I think he played, like, maybe, like, a... A high challenger level. Well, Purcell I mean, like, is a challenger. I thought Purcell level played, played pretty poorly. Played. I thought Purcell played yeah, pretty poorly, right. to be honest. But against, and then, like, I don't know how Thompson lost that match. I, I thought Philly played really well, but I don't really know how Thompson lost that match. True, true. Yeah. Well, that being said, great career for uh, Feli Lopez, and uh, we wish him all the best. Yeah, I mean, he's a he's tournament director for Madrid, right? He is. 
So he can still give himself a wild card if he needs to, if he wants to play again at some point. And you uh, stated how his kid is extremely well behaved, more well behaved than probably ninety nine percent of the kids in the states. It was amazing. Like his kid, like, and I don't know how old his kid is. I gotta look this up. I, I have his Wikipedia page open. Um, I gotta see how. I mean, his kid is like two years old, but the kid kind of like the kid didn't like make too much of a fuss. It was pretty impressive. Like uh-huh. you know. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, what else in Mallorca? I mean, this, we, we can do, so we can move to the semis. I mean, the uh, semis today. Well, how about I, the Rinder the Rinder neck Eubanks match? I mean, yeah, that was so painful for me because I I mean, <laughs> so basically I was three tie breaks away from hitting that eight hundred to one parlay. Yeah, and, yeah. And Rinder neck was one of the culprits, and uh, Paul uh, Wolf was the second one. But Wolf forced a uh, you know third set tie break. But Rin- yeah. I mean, he was also up a break in the second set, and it's just like he got broken back. Like, who gets broken by Eubanks? You know, twice. I mean, come on. It, it was just, it was just brutal. Um, yeah. But Eubanks, Eubanks is a brutal watch, man. He is. He is. Like, he's got like. Go ahead. He's like, most of his shots are pretty good, but I swear, like thirty percent of the time, he just hits like a horrendous shot that looks like us. Yeah, when like he, the ball when the ball goes like it hits the fence or it like two hop like he'll hit like a two hopper into the net and you're like I don't understand as a pro how you like can do that like no other also, pro- but he also hits a ton of good shots. That's the thing like it, it's yeah yeah but he just he gives away so many points it's like really it, it's it's well Harris gave away one more <laughs> that match that was an eyesore that semi today no, I guess we can move on to that. I, I I didn't watch Manorino versus Hoffman. I saw it was six and four. Um, I Eubanks Harris Day was an eyesore, man. Like that was just a an awful match to watch. Like we, we hit a nice bet. We hit, but we both hit plus what three fifty. I you know what? I I actually canceled out and I and I, and I pansied out and I went Eubanks money line. Oh no! So, I got one fifteen. I still don't feel bad, but I thought like because the way I was looking at it is like I thought either one was actually a good bet. But I thought the 115 was like a better ROI, like a better ROI. Cause I, I I thought every slant here was basically a coin flip. Like I think Eubanks should have won this 2 0 as easily as this 2 1. Like I don't think there was any particular reason why, like you know Eubanks how they have to... like on Bovada, they have set betting and then they have like Eubanks 2 0, Eubanks 2 yeah. Harris 2 0, Harris 2 1. Whatever had the highest odds is the one I was gonna take in that match. If okay. it was Harris 2 1, I was gonna take that one. If it was Harris yeah. 2 0, I was going to take that one. I think uh, maybe uh, Eubanks 2 0 was plus 325, and then 2 1 was plus 350. That's the way I thought about it because it's like, it's such a coin flip. Yeah. It's such a coin flip. So I'm just going to take the best odds here. Yeah. Um, but, but I, I would never gone Eubanks 2 0 because I, I agree with everything. There were like basically like equal chances of happening. But yeah. I, I, um, I, I decided to go with the money lines. I thought it was a slightly better, like, and I was, was this close. better to have the chance. Usually, I, I only take. Usually, I only take the, go ahead. Go ahead. Usually, I only take the two one mm-hmm. if I think that there's like a specific narrative for it. And in this case, I didn't think there was. Like, I thought this could have easily been like seven six seven six or seven six six four as it was like six. You know what I mean? Like, there's no reason. Right. Like, but I'm, like, I'm not surprised that Eubanks lost the first set. Like, but I just thought it was like a complete. And I'm not surprised. I don't feel bad about it. Like, I feel like I called the match perfectly and saying it was it was a complete yeah. point. It really was. Like it was. It was totally. But I was like this close to hitting the LWW for Eubanks. Oh, uh, okay. Just because like it was the highest odds on the board. I yeah. Think it was like plus seven twenty or something like that. So uh but whatever. I'll take the three twenty. Uh, three fifty. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so that was yeah, I I saw of a tennis match. Hundred percent. Like that tie break when Harris or when Eubanks hit a pass and it hit the net court and just jumped over his racket and like Harris went on his knees. And was, <laughs> you comment, you you texted me and I'm like, this is a joke. Like you hit the shittiest approach to Eubanks' forehand and you're going on your knees crying because it hit the net court. Like this is an embarrassment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like why don't you hit a better approach shot and then you don't even have to worry about that. Yeah. You know? It's like, and the fact that that shot Eubanks had hit the tape on is quite embarrassing in itself because it was the easiest forehand in the middle of the court. I mean, it wasn't the easiest, but like, 
It was, yeah, it's it was a very makeable pass. For a it was a very professional it was pretty, tennis player. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty yeah. easy. It was pretty easy. So, yeah, these guys are. I think they're fades at Wimbledon, to be honest. Well, I think a lot of these. I think Manorino is a fade too. I think yeah. most. I think these guys. I mean, I think basically quarters and in. What you saw was guys who are who. I mean, look, you you get to the quarters and you see that the the draw is Manorino, Mute, Eubanks, Rinderneck, Hoffman. Feliciano Lopez, Harris, and Pavel Kotov. And, like, if you're any of those eight guys, don't get a 250, man. Like, yeah. it, it, like you're agree. not winning Wimbledon. Like, none of those eight guys, like, you know, any of those eight guys, like, in order to get more than 250 points, this is something people don't realize. In order to get more than 250 points, you have to make the quarters of Wimbledon. Right. It's what. Which of those eight guys is a threat to make the quarters? I know. It's, a one, it's 180 points if you make a fourth round. Is that right? Yeah. Or it's that third round. No, it's 180 points. 180 to make a fourth round. Wow, that's not so. Bad. Which so well, again, Manorino, Mute, Eubanks, Rinderneck, Hoffman, Lopez, Harris, Kotov. Which of those guys is a threat to make a quarter? None of them. So they'd rather ball out in a 250, right? Yeah. The chances yeah. that you win those points are much higher there. I I agree, and I think this is uh, uh true with Monarino. like Monarino has made fourth round in Wimbledon before, but he realizes he's 35 years old. You know, playing best of five is very difficult for him, right? He he took advantage of this at the Winston Salem last year when he won won there before the U.S. Open. So right. I agree with you on those two points. Another thing I'll say about Manorino is that, um, I mean, looking at this surface, like this surface is really like beat up. This Mallorca surface, mm-hmm. like if you see the courts, like the courts are like they don't like. Whereas right. like you go to Wimbledon, like they're really nice courts. And like the courts, like actually play like relatively true at Wimbledon. Yeah, well, I've heard it's pretty slow grass. It's not fast. Yeah, the Wimbledon or yeah. this Mallorca. No, Wimbledon. Wimbledon, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, right? it's like yeah, it's it's. But it's like true grass, and it's like soft and like ash, actual grass, right? Whereas Mallorca, it's like I feel like it dries out extremely quickly. So it just well, it's also like the, a different grass. It's right. a different grass. Like I said, it's, it's a it's a pretty new event. Like it's, it's the the gra- the courts are all newly built, um, mm-hmm. and it looks like they just weren't like I don't know how to build a grass. Like, I have no idea how a grass court is built, but it's it seems like it's like I know they got a major investment from Wimbledon to build the event because Wimbledon wanted to add this as a as like a pre tournament two fifty, mm-hmm. um, and it looks like that's what they did because it's just like. It's kind of like grass on top of like, it, it looks weird. Like, like when you watch it, like it, it, the surface almost looks like dirt. Yeah. Yeah. Like, well, especially I, at the base. Uh, it's like Klaus Boulogard posted on Twitter, um, like at, in the beginning of the week, like this doesn't really play like true grass, you know? Yeah. It's and like, that's why you're seeing like, you saw like, I think Medvedev won this event, didn't he last year? Did he pass too? Yeah. Um, right. Yeah, no, it's it's not really true grass. Plus, I think it's like it just dries up real quick, so it gets hard. So it, it almost yeah. looks like a hard court. It's like so. Should we preview the final now? Um. So I mean, let's go to Eastbourne. All right, we'll go to Eastbourne yeah. and recap that, and then we'll go to yeah. the, the tournaments. So Eastbourne, not as much to talk about because we don't have any results yet from semifinals. Um, but the quarters, McDonald, McDonald became uh, McDonald beat Emer. Sad match for me because I had McDonald. I had the under there. The rare time I played a grass under, and like I yeah. always knew that three sets was the was the bugaboo here. So I don't feel bad about missing because like you know like that that was always the bugaboo. But like with Emer, I don't know. Like I, I didn't expect Emer to come back from a set down. Like I still I, he yeah, started, but like, Emer was uh, he won the second set and was up four one in the third. Yeah, and he blew no three one in the third. And he blew it. And I had Yimer money line at plus I think one forty or one fifty. I was pissed, but uh, I mean that's what you expect with Yimer. He just like goes away mentally, you know. Yeah. But case in point, McDonald also goes away mentally, as we saw today against Sarindula. He does, and um, but Yimer won a set, which was disappointing. The fact that you know, because I mean, like, like I said, like right, right. I felt like I called the flow of the match right. I just didn't like. I don't know. Yeah. I didn't realize. I, didn't, yeah. didn't realize, I always knew it was a threat. You know what I mean? But like, but like Emer was thinking about Wimbledon after he lost the first set, and it was like, oh, I just want to get to London. Like, then you win because like, yeah, 
you know, so I, I, I don't know. I, I don't think that was necessarily a bad bet. Um, and then we called the Sarin. We called Lodin the next match. three matches perfectly. We called Perfect. the next three matches perfectly. So Barrer against Ketchmanovich. Yeah. I posted in our Discord that we have with uh, Dave from MP9 and, a, and a D Prodigy and a couple other guys. Mm-hmm. Um, I posted there um, that this was a coin flip match, mm-hmm. and it truly was. Like I think Ketchmanovich got broken serving for the first set. Barrera might have gotten broken serving for the match. I don't remember, but like it was. So Ketchmanovich was up a break in both sets and choked. Was Kitchmanovich up in the yeah. was, he, was he up the break at 5 4 in the second? I think so. I could... No, I Barrera so. served for the match at 5 3 in the second. Oh, and, they, okay. and Barrera choked. So, like, but no, but you're right. Kitchmanovich was, yeah. Kitchmanovich was up a break in the, in the second set of all. Kitchmanovich up a break. Barrera broke, broke back, went a break up, and then Kitchmanovich broke a serve for the match. Anyways, the point is, this was a complete coin flip match. Coin flip match, yeah. Um, and, like, Barrera. We got him Brer early, not early, early. Like we got him, I got him on him in the middle. I guess, I guess from what I heard, the line opened at like Brer plus one thirty, and I got Brer at like one fifteen, I think, or one ten. Um, but like any plus money was good in that match. Yeah, I got it at plus one ten, I think. Yeah, and any plus money was good there. Like, yeah, I, I think it closes a true flip. Yep, it did. Like people, people, uh, people got on that eventually. But if you were able to hit the early. Hit that early. I think Barrer is the mentally stronger player of the two. That's how I view that match, right? So I think I probably would put put the line actually Barrer slightly favored if I was a book, just because of like the mental toughness aspect. Like I, I don't think Ketchup, I don't think I put either guy at plus money. What? I don't think I put either guy at plus money. No. If you were gonna do that, it'd be like minus one fifteen, minus one. My minus one ten, minus one ten is probably the accurate line. Yeah. But. Uh, um... Yeah, no, that was great. And then Sarinda Lojang, that was just like a no brainer. Like we we called that match perfectly. Yeah, perfectly, perfectly. He's just so much better, man. Just so much better. Well, is that, like anybody, it's like the guys who are gonna give Zhang trouble are guys who can rally with him. Right. Right. Like guys who are aggressive enough to like to not just give him like floater balls to hit, and guys who are um um. And guy, guys who are aggressive enough to not hit floater balls, but guys who are consistent enough to make four balls run in the court. Mm-hmm. I mean, if we look at his, um, I guess the Madrid one run was really good because, like, he beat Nori and Fritz. But, like... We talked about Zhang two days ago. I'm going to say the same thing. Like, any given day, man, that guy can be anywhere. Yeah. Like, you, I, like he's a guy who I just like to take plus money lines against. But like the two matches he won today was Sonigo or in, in this tournament in Eastbourne was were Sonigo and Cressy, who can both be exceptionally erratic. Right. And then when he finally had to play a guy that like just makes a ton of balls, he got smoked. But it's also aggressive enough to like make him like to like make him right. hit a little play a little bit of defense. Right, right, right. Because like if you make like I don't know how well like a guy like a Munar or like an Arch like they would do against him because like the guy who just like you know what I mean like I don't know if like running down right. the ball just running down ball is gonna be good enough like right right yeah yeah but that was great I mean we we got what minus one and a half sets at minus one fifty five I mean that's no, plus one fifty five plus one fifty five yeah yeah which is crazy like Shang is really not that good I don't know what... well, I don't think so much bad I think this is a classic example of like most of the time you have derivative lines that the books put out there Derivative lines being like not spread, not the true money line. Like usually the books yeah. pop the money line first, and the spread is usually somewhat based off the money line. Mm-hmm. And then this, and then um, the set spread is like, and then the, and then everything else kind of comes off of that, right? Based off the money line, and the spread. Yeah. This was a match where I thought, um, like with Zhang, man, like I think there might be an opportunity to hit derivative derivatives on him because, like, I don't think the derivatives play for him like purely mathematically. Meaning, like, if he's, you know, if he's if, if he's forty percent likely to win a match, like because of how he plays, that you know, and I and I'm not, you know, if forty percent likely to win the match means you're sixty percent likely to win a set, and I, you know, I didn't do the math out to calculate the exact like what that exactly means mathematically, but if forty percent likely to win the match, let's say, means you're sixty percent likely to win the match. I don't think that necessarily applies for him because he's so erratic. I think like, I I think you'll see more. My guess is you'll see more extreme outcomes with him. Well, I just feel like Cressy was so overvalued in this event 
that like beating him kind of told the books that like, oh, he's actually playing good tennis and he should be valued highly against Sarundalo. Even though Sarundalo and Cressy are just totally different players, right? But like, yeah. Cressy was so overvalued here. You know, so I feel like Zhang, like they they just thought, oh, he beat Zhang, he beat Cressy, you know, he beat Sonigo, so he must be like pretty good. Mm-hmm. You know, but like we all know watching them watching the matches that he's in fact not that good. You know, well, I just think he's erratic. Like I think he's, he's he yeah. like I think he can be really good, right? Like we you know, like he can be really good, yeah. um, but he can be completely bad, which I love to I love again. Like, I mean I thought it was a great bet. It was, it was. Um, and then we also hit the Wolf Paul match pretty correct in terms of saying you take Wolf plus the games. Right. Um, it was a sweat. We got there at the end, but um, um, it was a sweat. But like, a, I mean, we know that Tommy Paul. This happens to Tommy Paul quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually thought it was a pretty good match. I didn't see too much of it uh, because I was watching more of the uh, the Monterino um, Mute match. Yeah, I mean, I watched I watched this match. I thought it was a pretty good match. Like Wolf, Wolf is a, a pretty good player, man. Like he's growing on me as someone who's a who's a solid player. Okay, but he's another guy that can be really, really good, but he can also be absolutely awful. And there's not I, much. I would put him in the same category as, as Shapovalov and Zhang, though. Okay, that's fair. Like. But I, I feel like he doesn't like his base level can be very low. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Like he's he's in between like a, a super steady guy like a Sarundalo and a um right and like a guy who can be like a complete mess like Shapo or Zhang. Like he's somewhere in between, but he's yeah he's yeah. I, I, I still think that. he's closer to the Zhang uh, Shapo than the Sarundalo. Like I don't know. He's not there, and I agree he's a little bit above that, but, like, I, he can also be really, really bad. Yeah, I mean, we're just arguing mag- magnitude here. The same, but yeah. we, 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 we agree on a general right. level. Right. Um, he's fun to watch, though, man. Yeah, like, even in the match against Paul, he, made, he hit some absolutely awful shots. Right. Like, yeah. he's just capable of, of, of yeah, hitting, hitting some awful yeah. shots. But, like, he also hits a lot of really good shots, plays a lot of really good plays, especially off the forehand. Mm-hmm. That forehand and that slice serve are really, really um and I love that he has a slice serve because like very few guys on the tour have that. I think it differentiates him. Yeah, it's like it it he plays that on a deuce court, right? And it like tails yeah. away. No, he, yeah. oh, on the he plays it on he plays the plays deuce. He's a lefty. No, he's a righty. Is he righty? Yeah. I sound really stupid here. I might sound really dumb. No, JJ but, Wolf is a righty. No, you're you're right. He's a righty. He yeah. plays it on the ad side, and that slice yeah. serve tails away from. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. I I try to hit that sometimes on the on the deuce court as a lefty, and then kind of try to yeah. slice and it tails away from the guy's back. Yeah. Hit. Now you're a lefty too, so it goes. It's through. a good serve. It's a good serve. But yeah, I, it's something that people don't like use that much yeah. for some reason but uh yeah he's fun to watch um so w- that uh this that mcdonald uh Sarindola match was wild this morning that was crazy right like we our bet of the day was uh Sarindola minus two minus one oh yeah minus two and it, it could still push right. it can still push but we thought that we were totally out of it for a while i mean Sarindola was a set double breakdown yeah it's crazy and like McDonald is just like he choked away that second set. Like he just got really tentative, really tight. Sarindola just started making a little a few more balls, right? Just being a little bit more proactive and yeah. aggressive to kind of safe targets. And he just totally turned that match around. And then we got the 7-5. And I thought we would actually win that bet because like McDonald broke straight away and he was serving to start the match or start the third set. Um, so if he and I think he went a four love. He did. Heard. And like he did. all we needed was just like two more goals, right? And we would have won because six one, right? Because yeah. he started the third serving. So it's like it's crazy. So they're resuming tomorrow at what? Like what? It's four two, I think, or five, five two. Five two. But Mackie is serving first, right? So if we yeah. if if Dolo breaks, then we push. Yep. Right? Yeah. So, 
just a totally wild match. Just like so many momentum swings, especially on grass, man. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, um, really, really uh, unfortunate timing on the rain, man. Yeah, yeah. Because like, how annoying is that to have to come out and play like one game? Well, hopefully, it's one game for us, or two games, whatever. But like, you know, it's not, it's not going to be very. Well, it's probably not going to be long, right? Like, I find it funny that they're actually like. So it's it's funny because they have that match at eleven, and they have the women's final at twelve thirty on center court. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of surprised they didn't do the um, do the semi, the other semi first on that court, then finish that match. It's not going to take very long to finish. Then do the women's final, and then bring those guys out, and then bring out the guys. Yeah, again. like I thought that would have been a, a better order of play. That would have been it's, especially for the fans. For sure. Yeah, yeah. I, like I don't, I don't really see like. Like, even if it goes somehow to 7.5 or 7.6, that's not going more than a half hour. The thing is, are they expecting rain tomorrow? Oh, that's a good question. If they are, it's a complete mess for the tournament because those guys don't want to be there. It's just windy, but it's not going to rain. All right. So, should be okay. But, like, if, if rain yeah. is in the forecast, then I understand. But, like, I, I agree with you in terms of the fans, like... Um. Yeah. So let's uh let's preview that second semifinal. Um. Is is there a line up for that, or is the line complete? Or, or no, or actually, second... I I thought it would be more uh like um Paul would become less of a favorite in that match. Yeah. But actually, it's gone the other way, and Barrera I think went to plus one eighty, which was. Oh, is this, is this not a prime Tommy Paul dud spot? Oh, absolutely. Like, why if you're like Tommy Paul actually I think could do something at Wimbledon. Like 100 percent I totally agree with you. So, like, if you're if you're Tommy Paul, do you really want to win this match? I was surprised that the line moved this way. I I mean, like I was surprised the books have a line still up on this match. And I think it's a really, really silly thing by them actually that had to keep a line up here. If I were if I were the books, I would have pulled the line down here. Okay. Um because, because like I like, played Barrera initially, like at plus one seventy, just because like Paul just chokes away every match, it seems. You know, and it's yeah, like Yeah. I hear you on that. For me, I think it's more that um for me it's more that um I, I was I, I he's just a better player than Barrera, and I think like there's a pretty good gap. So I thought like initially I was I was like, there's value on there's the if like I was like never Paul, maybe Barrera, and then I then I I cashed out because I really like I wish I initially thought like they're really this like we talked about Tommy Paul dud spot, but he hasn't had a dud since Elba in Delray Beach, which is was like 25 matches ago or so now. You know, it's been a long time since he's had a had a dud. Um but like but this this is a prime dud spot, man. Yeah, he has to play two matches in a day. Like I Barrera can use like Barrera, Barrera, I like Barrera has much more motivation here than Paul, right? I would say so. Plus my initial, my, my initial thought here was like this, like on a Friday, right? If this was being played Friday, yeah. It's in Eastbourne, right? Which is pretty close, I think, to London. So like you, your close. trip is you, your trip is really short. Not that Mallorca is far, but it's a little further. The court plays pretty similarly to Wimbledon. Like it's about as similar as a court as you'll get to Wimbledon. Yeah. So like you're um, so like you don't really need to get out of here. Whereas like Mallorca, I think if you were trying to compete at Wimbledon, you really don't want to be there too long. The thing which like gives me a little bit of cause to pause is that Paul is on the top half of the Wimbledon draw, which means he plays the first match on Tuesday. But I still see here's what I'm going with this though. It's like so I would 100% have agreed with you if it was a match Friday and match Saturday. But, like, if he's going to win this match and then play a final, that's four to potentially – that's four to six sets of tennis. That's basically playing an extra match at Wimbledon. I mean, I, I do you think Paul, like, looks at the draw? Like, he plays this Japanese qualifier, Mojizuki. And I don't think it matters plays- the draw. I don't think the draw is particularly relevant here. I think it's more like, does he really want to play? Does he really want to play four sets 
at least of tennis two days, three days before a slam. I, I trust me. I agree with you. I was happy that this move at like as a holder of a Barrera money line ticket here, I was happy that this move, match got postponed because like, I, I think that the chances that Paul has a dud spot is much higher than Barrera having a dud spot here. Yeah. I think D- Barrera actually wants these 250 points and he probably thinks that the chances that he gets points here is much higher than at Wimbledon. Like we talked about before, like right. Paul, I don't know. I, I mean, like, well, Paul, where is Paul in the draw? I mean, but it's an easy that, like, draw. Me Paul, like, Paul's a good enough player that, like, just as a player I'm talking, not necessarily as, like, a like looking at his draw, but, like, just as a player, like, Wimbledon quarters is possible for him. Oh, 100%. And especially with his draw, he has actually a really good shot at making quarters because he has two... He plays Moja Huki, um, a Japanese qualifier who I actually haven't heard of in the first round. Plays the winner of Ryonich Novak in the second round. And then in the third round, he's in the, he most likely would be Sarundalo or Lechka, which is like as easy as you get for a Grand Slam third round. Um, and well, about as easy as you get. Like, it's, that's, it's, that's a... Yeah, but it's it's pretty easy considering that what this draw looks like. It's then, okay. It's not bad. I mean, he's in, you forget he's in like the Medvedev he is... sixteen. What? He's in the Medvedev sixteen as a fifteen seed. Yeah, like I'm not saying the draw is bad. Right. I'm saying like he is a top sixteen player, so like he's gonna like he's gonna get like he's gonna get decent draws there, like right because he's gonna play somebody in the seventeenth or twenty four range. Like I don't know if Sarundalo is the worst seed on grass between seventeen and twenty four. Probably not, but he's. <sighs> I mean, also considering Sarindolo is probably going to go is going really deep in this tournament as well. You know, I'm not saying he's like a fade spot in the first two rounds, but I'm just like, but I don't think it's as bad. Like, I I think there's a different. I think there's a big difference between playing two sets in a day on grass or two two in like two in a game or two or three in a game. Like, yeah. you know, like, like if they're practicing right, they're probably practicing like not much less than they're going to like not much like one match looks probably pretty similar to a practice in terms of like not mentally right but in terms of like amount they're hitting i think paul got the easiest possible draw he could have at wimbledon um i'll disagree with easiest possible but he got a pretty good draw like he's in the medvedev section right and then like if he gets through medvedev he would like he's in the sissy pass quarter which is super easy. I mean, you also have like guys like Shelton, Corda, uh, and Nori there, but they're all winnable, right? It's not like like you know, like that's the quarter I would want to be in. Maybe I would rather be in the like the 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 third quarter with Sinner and Rude, but still, like I mean, obviously we'll get more into the draw later. I'm just saying, like, I have a feeling he's looking at this draw and it's like, I want to get over there. You know, because like I feel like I can make a deep run. I, mean, like I, said, I don't know how much he's looking at the draw. I don't think he analyzes it to the level that we do as like fans. I would hope not. I don't think it's particularly healthy for a player. But I do. I think regardless, like just body wise, like you're gonna go, you're gonna start playing five set tennis matches. Yeah. You have a shot. Like regardless of the draw, like he's a good enough. I mean, he's a good enough player to make the quarters in almost any section. I would say he's good enough to potentially make the quarters in any section that doesn't involve uh, doesn't involve Djokovic. Um. So like, yeah. So like, like, so we're, we're saying. I mean, we're going on and on, but I think this is a tiny ball dud spot. So mm-hmm. I, I like, I like, uh, I like Barrera here at plus. Is that our play of the day tomorrow? I think so. I mean, what what do you think? Like, what about Barrera? What about Barrera two zero? If you want to get risky. And you want to get spicy? What up? Like, Ooh, so the spicy. odds aren't great on it. It's only like three eighty, so I think I'm just gonna stick with the money line. But it was I was looking at it. Spicy, three seventy, and uh, not quite good enough. Yeah, yeah, not quite good enough. I, I let's just stick with the money line. Okay, one eighty. Um, I already have it at plus one seventy. I'm actually very surprised, very very surprised that it's gone the other way. Like I would expect it to go that down to like plus one fifty. Yeah. But yeah. uh yeah. 
I also played the, I mean, I expected this match to be played yesterday, but like I, I, I played the over 22 and a half here as well. Um, so that's a pretty low over under. Um, and I think this this match is a very, very good chance of going three sets. Well, now I don't. I would have said yes Yesterday on Friday. Now, yeah, now, yeah. Yeah, now yeah. I think I would get out of that bet if you could, because I think this is a prime telling Paul Dud spot. Okay. Okay. All right. But, like, if Paul, for example, if Paul is up, like, a set and a break, like, he's going to choke. He could. I mean, he doesn't choke every time. He's not the worst, but he he could. Yeah, he's, he's a he choke. He could. Player. He does it very often. He did it against Baez. Yeah. yeah. You know? Um, I don't know. I, I feel like Tommy Paul and Fokina prevent a lot of live betting opportunities. When they're well, off. they create them. Huh? They create them. Yeah, they do. For the public. Like us. Yeah. <laughs> like, if he's up a set in the break... You know, yeah, I think that's a great live betting opportunity right there. But I agree. Um, yeah. All right, so that's one of our play of the days tomorrow. Um, Barrera money line at plus one eighty. Uh, let's go to Mallorca. Uh, the Mallorca final is Monterino and Eubanks. So I know we slightly disagree here. But I am. I'm actually back to your side now. But but you really? go ahead and you go ahead and explain. I, I've got a different reason than you probably. But you go ahead and explain why you like my uh, Mario here. So I am all over Monterino. Like I was shocked to see this line where it is. I thought it would be Monterino like minus two hundred and Eubanks like plus one fifty or one sixty something yeah. like along those lines. And I am all over the minus one and a half. I actually put five units on it. So I, I there are a couple of reasons why. So we just complained about how bad the Eubanks Harris match was, right? And like how neither guy could really make like three balls in the court. And that's exactly what Monterino wants here. You know, Monterino is much more steady. He's also going to put that ball in awkward positions. You know, like he hits very flat balls. So those balls are going to bounce low and be very skid through the court and be very awkward for Eubanks, who's like a six, eight guy, trouble bending down. Eubanks is in six, eight. eight. How, how tall is he? I think he's like six, 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 seven at the minimum. No. I don't think so. Unless maybe, maybe I mean, I, I'm like, after getting he's a tall hand dude. wrong, I feel really dumb. So. I thought he was like, oh, wow, I did not realize. Okay, you're right, he's 6'7". He's 6'7". Like, that feels so mislisted, but maybe he's that tall, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, he's really tall. Um, so that ball is going to be skidding down. Um, also, the last time they played was this year in um, Miami when yeah. Eubanks won. So I'm not looking at the head-to-head too much because, first of all, that court is like a slow, hard court, right? And second of all, Eubanks totally redlined that entire match, and it was still a tight three setter. Like I think Eubanks played one of the, the matches. Of it was a tight two setter. Was it tight two setter? Yeah, it was, it was six like and four. six. Okay, six and six. But I thought Eubanks played like some of the best tennis of his life. Right, he just redlined totally, and it was just like everything went in, even though when even even when you thought like it wasn't possible. So um, I. I don't know. Like, so the fact that that was on slow, he redlined, won a really tight match. And this is on grass, which is Monterino's preferred surface. And that ball kind of bounces lower and skids through the court. I think that really favors Monterino here. Um, What are, what are your reasons here? So, uh, you know, I don't disagree with, I actually don't think the flat ball is terrible for Eubanks. Like the skidding's a little bit worse because of the height, but he actually did pretty well with low balls for a guy who's I think for a guy who's tall. I don't really think I don't feel like low balls are a problem for him. But he's gonna have to hit that more consistently here than in any match he's played. Agreed. Like that's all Monterino's gonna do to him. Agreed, but I don't think Eubanks is particularly terrible at low balls. Um okay. so I'll I'll, I'll agree, so I'll agree with that. Um, all right, well, so that, that's that's the one part I'll, I'll kind of disagree with. The other thing that scares me is like Eubanks does have a good serve, 
he's played a ton of tie breaks this week. Like how so of the he's played eleven sets this week mm-hmm. and six have gone to tie breaks. Yeah. Eleven sets this week and six have gone to tie breaks. Um but can't you say Monterino is a better returner than any of those guys he's played? He's played what? Rindernecht? He's played Lloyd. Rindernecht, Harris. Shelton, Harris, Nicholson. Yeah, I mean, Manorino's yeah. a better grass court player than any of those guys. I agree. Like, I think Manorino's going to win. At minus 145, I'll back it. This line came out at minus 160. I thought that was too far. And then it went down to minus 140. Now it's stabilized a little bit to 145. I like it at minus 160. I think this should be minus like 185, minus 200 for Monterino. Like how is, if Eubank misses the first serve and that ball comes back in a rally, like Monterino has like a 60-40 edge. Um, I don't necessarily think so. I don't think it's that big of an edge. Like, because like Monterino, like he doesn't move that well. Like Eubank's, you you banks is gonna he'll just go for winners, and like he'll he'll play the same way as every against everybody else. I don't think he's particularly bad against that skidding ball. Um, like I don't think it's and again with the serve like he'll make enough for serve I think to get plenty of holds. Like I think it's close, but we're arguing somewhat semantics. I I do think Marion is by far like I think I think there's a gap here, and I think Marion is more likely to win. I think it's like sixty forty. But as you're saying, it's like 65-35. Mm, 70-30. Then you're putting the, the money line at like minus 210. Yeah, so I would... That's kind of where I would put it. I mean, more maybe more like minus 200. So that's 67-33. Yeah. That's, that's so we're not I'm that putting. far off. I mean, the, again, it's 50 cents, but like... Yeah, I mean... I, so I do I agree with you. I think Manorino should be the favorite here. And I think that... What I was going to say, the reason that actually, I would actually bump it a little further now. I'd actually bump it to, I'm, we're probably pretty close now where I think it's probably mm-hmm. like a, I think it should be like a minus, like, I think it should be like minus, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think, I think there's enough room now to take, to take Manorino here. Um, I think it's like, I, I think the book should have, is it like minus 180 plus 150 or something? Um, okay. but, and then the reason I say it is I think it's also a potential fatigue spot for you banks. Definitely. Plus it's his first ATP final. So he's going to be feeling it pressure wise. Like it's maybe, a- maybe not. Right. Like you don't know, you don't know. Right. Some guys feel it. Some guys don't. I guess, but that's a variable you got to consider. Whereas like Manorino has been in the spot before he's won titles in his career. Um, I, I don't know. I I just like don't look at that Miami match with too much, um, you know, like purpose because I like, do because I think like I I think that like I think grass is better for both guys. I don't think either. I guy, disagree. I think, I think hard. I think like a, a slower hard court is better for Eubanks than this court. How? I mean, he's like he's so erratic, Eubanks. Like he needs short points. Well, I, I think it so I think it helps him against a guy like Harris, for example, who's not gonna like doesn't have the rally tolerance and can't return that many balls in the court. I think against Manorino, I think a slower court helps him because it gives him a little bit more time to set up for his shots. That's how I view it. I mean, it takes away from the serve, though, right? Like the serve, I mean, slightly. I but I, I have a feeling there are going to be some rallies here. Like Monterino is going to get some serves back, especially if Eubanks has to hit some seconds, and that's going to be very problematic for Eubanks. I mean, Eubanks has made seventy percent. He here, Eubanks in this tournament has got has made, and granted, he didn't do as well the week. So this is an interesting thing, right? So Eubanks has made seventy to seventy five percent of serves. For serves in every match this tournament, but he's played such shitty returners. So when you, no, no, but this is just making for serves. He's he's made seventy seventy five percent. No, no, no. I just but if you play worse returners, the chances that you make for serves are higher because you feel less pressure. That's why Federer's first serve I don't is always know. worse against Djokovic or Nadal. I don't know. I don't know about this. It's psychological. I, some, no, no, no. I, I have some stats on this. I don't know. I think that the better server you play, the worse your first serve 
te technically is. It's not like making a first serve is not like making a first serve against everyone. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know, man. I, I, I'd have to see a little more on this. I don't, I okay. don't know. Like, okay. yeah, okay. I don't know by that. Thing. I will say this could go both ways because like, you, there's an argument here that, okay, you is going to make a lot of first serves. That's one argument. The other argument would go the other way and say that, okay, like, is that really sustainable? But either way, I like Manorino here. I'm with you. I'm backing Manorino. I think there's enough. enough that another play of the day? Manorino. What? Is that another play of the day, Kennedy? It is, uh, yeah, it's another play of the day. It's another play but of the day. You like just the money line, right? You don't like the minus one and a half? Yeah. Yeah. Because I do think, like, I do think there's going to be a tie break here. Like, Eubanks just, he's like, he's too good offensively. Like, but like, yeah, I think there'll be a tie break here, but. Okay. And I bet it's the other scary thing. So Eubanks' his career tie, like, Manorino for his career has only won 45% of tie breaks. Okay, but we've discussed this before. It's a, it's a coin flip. He did win. No, but like, it's, it's I, I don't think, but like. It might be like 53-47 Eubanks if it gets to a tiebreak. Instead of like a 50-50. Okay. I, I, I do think Monterino will be able to squeak a few breaks. And I think that fatigue angle um applies here. The fact that Eubank has played, you know, quite a lot of tennis. Monterino also looks pretty good. Like that knee problem tends to be a thing of the past. Um, I'm glad he didn't play three sets against Hoffman because then I would be worried here. I probably wouldn't bet this if that, that match won three sets. Yeah. Um, but I, I just think Monterino is so much a better tennis player and I, I like this spot for him as well. So I don't disagree with that. I just think grass is an equalizer. But grass but that's is the surface for Monterino too. And I think it's still better for Monterino than it is for Eubanks, even if it might be Eubanks' best surface, too. So I, I, think, think, I think regardless of that, it's an equalizer, right? It just brings matches more towards 50-50 because you're going to have more holds of serve, more tie breaks. To like... me, not necessarily here because Monterino is also better on grass. If if Monterino was better on hard court or clay, then yes, I would agree with you. But the fact that Monterino is better on grass than other surfaces negates that equalizing component. Oh, I don't. I, I see. I, I just. I just think like, okay. Any two guys, like it just brings like between almost any two guys, unless one guy is like a grass specialist and the other guy's not. Between any two guys, it just equalizes because like you just have tighter sets. Like you just you just fundamentally have less breaks. Like we talked about this before, right? If like the lower like once the serve once the return points one percent just get get low like below thirty percent, you're mm -hmm. talking about tie breaks and it becomes anybody's game. And I do think man, we'll be able to build a little more than thirty percent of points on return. But the point remains, like, like there's a like once you get below thirty percent of points one on return, like the things really start to equalize. Like the low, the, the worst guy has a much better chance. All right, but I mean, also we've talked about this Majorca clay is not uh, Majorca grass is not really like true grass, right? It's uh, no, I mean, look, I, we still agree at Manorino is the play. I just think it's a lot yeah. closer than you. I think it's a. I think it's a for me it's a, it's a GBM play of the day, but it's a um because we both okay. agree I think there's enough room for it and because you love it, but it's like it's not at the same level as um like I, I feel much better about the Barrera match now than I do this one. Okay, I mean we might keep we're gonna keep this out of the GBM plays because I'm all over the spread here at minus one and a half and you're over the uh the money line. Okay. So we're gonna keep this one out. All right. Uh, yeah, I, I'm. I, I'm glad that you shifted a little bit towards me, but I I understand your point. I understand your points. I'm just not fully sold on Eubanks. Like I really don't think he's good. But, and like we were complaining about how bad he was today against against Harris. I'm not sold that he's good either. Like this is more about like, it's not about is he good. Like no, like it's about like how much of an equalizer grass is to be honest and like how much variance like plays a role like okay 
All right. Well, quick break, and then we will come back and do our uh, power rankings. Yep. This week, this will be interesting. All right. Welcome back to the show. So um, we are going to do now our uh, grass court power rankings. Um, so <laughs> when we were when I was doing these uh, this afternoon, um, after number two, I was just stumped. I was like, yeah, yeah, let's call it a day. Like, what's yeah. after this? Uh, but we we sucked it up and we we came up with our, our top 20. Yeah. So, um, I think uh, we can both agree that Djokovic is one and Alcaraz is two. And I don't think we need to even talk about this, but this could be a podcast with no Djokovic or Alcaraz talk. So that's kind of cool. Right. Okay. Um, so then who did you go with at number three, Manny? Um, so just like we did with the clay court, I have like tears. Yeah, so do I. Right. But the thing with this is that there's so many guys jumbled up here um, that I only have two next tiers. Wow. So I'm similar, but I do have a pretty clear tier here with two guys for three and four. Okay. Interesting. I'm curious to see what, what those three. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I have 10 got 10 guys in the, uh, in the next tier. Wow. I think, so I don't, I don't disagree. Anyone can beat anyone. I, I get where you're going with it. Um, okay. but I do disagree. I, I have two guys who are pretty clearly three A and three B. And that's Tiafo and Rublev. Okay, interesting. All right. Um, I just think like, and not that those guys, the guys in like six to ten can't beat them because they could, like they're, they're, they would still be good close matches. Okay. But I just think like, I think those guys are a cut. I think those two are cut above anybody else. Like if you look at like, right, like Tiafo won, what he wins? Tiafo won Stuttgart, right? He beat Struf in the final. Right. Right, so Tiafu has a title. Rublev um, made the final of Halle. Yeah, public. yeah, which I, I think was kind of a little bit of a one-off. Slash, I don't, I can't put Blue, Blue Book in that tier because like Blue Book on his best day actually probably does go there. But like, there's just so many bad days for Blue Book. You can't right. like you have to, you have to discount that out. Um, so I have Rublev three and Tiafu four. But so we agree on the top four then. We so, agree. Uh, it's and I, and I I see him as three a three b like if you want to flip those three and four for me it doesn't really make a squad a difference like I really I really couldn't differentiate between those two because I think Tia, I think like but Tiafo I think is like he's top ten now but I think he's still kind of underrated like he's there man like he's not like a fake top ten he's there so he played an exhibition against Djokovic today and it won three sets I put no stock in that so. Okay. All right. Fair. But I'm just... <laughs> and didn't they play a super tie break? Like, they did. They did. Yeah, yeah. I, I put zero stock in those. Like, okay. okay. Uh, it's just crazy that like the gap between Djokovic and Algaraz and then like Rublev and Tiafo is just absolutely massive, right? And I think there's been a gap. There's less of a gap to the next tier, but I still think there's a gap oh, for me. Okay. So who else is then? Who 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 are the top few guys then in your in that tier then besides uh, Tiafo and Rublev? So three and four, three is Rublev, Tiafo is four. Okay. My number five guy might shock and surprise you because he hasn't played a grass court match, but I trust him so much in terms of his physicality and his toughness that he can make a run at Wimbledon despite not playing. And okay. I bet, guess, guess who that guy is? Kachanov. Yes. Yeah. So I, I definitely, I have Kachanov in my rankings as well. Okay. I bumped him down because he hasn't played grass and okay. I mean, he didn't, he didn't play Wimbledon last year either. Um, I think he was injured or something. That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> injured by Putin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, but I, I don't have him as fifth. And the reason I don't have him as fifth is because um, I don't think he has a chance against, I don't think he has much of a chance against any of the guys above him. Um, maybe he's just against Tiafo or Rublev. He has no chance against Alcaraz or Djokovic. I don't think Rublev or Tiafo have either, though. So that's the okay. Thing. Interesting. You know? So it's like my my fifth, and only because and like this isn't and it's this feels tricky too because it depends on like how we define this because mm -hmm. I'm defining this as like one match, not necessarily like chance to win a tournament, but like, but like more like average match performance. Mm -hmm. Um, my fifth is Sinner. 
And like that doesn't mean I think he's fifth most fifth person most likely to win Wimbledon because of the injury issues. But like I think he's the only other guy who has a peak level that can compete with the with with the top two guys. Well, I actually think he has a higher peak than Rublev or Tiafo. He does, just, yeah. The chance that he gets there is so slim to none that and so like, then that's why that's why this gets tricky to how you define it because I don't like like do I like do I think I actually think there's other guys on my list who are more likely to win Wimbledon and like all these guys have zero likelihood at this point but like slightly more likely um whereas I mean, personally like, if I'm like picking a player I would rather have a player who's tough mentally tough physically and will ne- like never give in versus someone who's like fragile but has a higher peak so that's why I'm always gonna like. Presently, you know, the way the tennis is right now, I would always put Kachanov ahead of Sinner in a Grand Slam power rankings. Yeah, I mean, it, it literally depends on, like, I, I get it. I get it, and that's that's, that's fine. Um, Sinner, for yeah. me, is not that far behind. Um, he is number seven for me. Okay. So he's not, like, super far yeah. behind. I, I respect his upside and, like... Honestly, in that bottom half of the draw, he's really the only guy I can see troubling Djokovic because, like, he has that high of an upside, right? So if he, for some reason, uh, gets there, right, and, like, finds that level, he can trouble anyone. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um. So just just by that fact, I have to put him up there, you know? But yeah. he's really shown nothing, this entire grass court swing. Um. Grass court, grass court swing is short. And the thing, the funny thing about it is, like, when I look through, like, how many guys have shown something? Like, we've kind of been through all the guys that have shown something. Well, we didn't go over my number six, which was Demonor. Oh, okay. I think that's high for Demonor. Um, okay. I have him a few spots lower. He just has no weapons, man. Grass helps him because it's a little quicker and he can, like, he can get a little more like he's aggressive. He gets a little help from the grass. He, he gets a lot of help from the grass and, and he's, he's darn good on the grass. I have a really hard time putting him in the top 10 just because of the lack of weapons, man. Or sorry, I have, to, I have a hard time putting him that hot, but I see it, man. Like these, like I have kind of five through. But there are a lot of guys right now that have more weapons, like say Fritz, for example. Uh, but like, the problem is Fritz misses way more and is way more erratic right now. No, and, and I have 10 guys in this next tier. The tier, the tier that Sinner leads, I have 10 guys in that tier. Ten guys. So basically you and I have, are the same point as one. So the guys in that tier, because it's really hard to rank these guys specifically, the guys in my tier there are Sinner, and this, this is the order I have them in, which you might disagree with. Okay. The order is Sinner, Fritz, Medvedev, Kachanov, Demonor, Hubie, Bublik, Griegspor, RBA. Interesting. Okay. So is there anybody from that list who you have in that next tier that I didn't? Well, so I have the, so for me, I put Rublev and Tiafo in that second Three, four tier. tier. Yeah. Yeah. And there are 10 guys yeah. in my tier. So in that tier for me, it's Rublev, Tiafo, okay. Kachanov, Demonor, Sinner, Greekspor, who's number eight for me. Bublik is number nine. Zverev is number 10, Korda is number 11, and Medvedev is number 12. Okay. So I think the difference is, right, if I look at that, the difference that I, I put in that, in like the, so I, the difference is I have Tiafo and Rublev a tier above. I put, mm-hmm. I split them out in their own tier. Mm-hmm. And then you had Fritz in that, in that big tier, no, right? No, Fritz is not even in oh, this. So, you, so I have Fritz in my tier. Um, I have Fritz, Fritz in the next tier. I have Fritz. I have Hubie, who you didn't have in, right? Hubie's in that next tier. Oh, tier for me. oh he is in that tier. Okay. No, in the next tier, not not. Oh, okay. So, so he's not in that big that, that big group. Okay. So I have Fritz, Hubie, and RBA. Okay. And RBA is the bottom. Of the tier. Honestly, RBA could get dropped to the top of the next tier. It's close. It's tough. Like I had a like RBA had such a good run, and uh-huh. like I guess I guess I'm kind of buying into like maybe he's been hurt. With like I heard about this foot thing on the Bet Rivers podcast. Like so, if he's actually if he's if it was a foot injury and he's healthy now, given his grass court kind of prowess and career, like I'm moving him up into this tier because of that. Um, okay. 
So, uh, uh, so I guess Fritz is in that tier. He's just like too good of a tennis player not to be in this tier. And like, he has a good enough serve. Like there's no reason like play wise that he shouldn't be in that tier in this tier. And he has been like sits upon bad where I can leave him out entirely. And where it's like a complete disaster. He made the quarters last year of Wimbledon. So like he's, he's made a run. He's won Eastbourne, I think twice. So like, there's some career pedigree here too, that he can play on grass. So like, for me, I, when you add all I, that, I see what you're saying, but it's it's been a rough vein of form for him recently. Like I I've, I almost feel like he's he's like struggling to win matches now because he's quite one dimensional, and I, I don't feel like he's moving on the grass quite as well as last year. I um, agree with he that. Doesn't, I agree he also doesn't have that confidence of winning a tournament heading into Wimbledon. You so I agree I mean? with all of that. Like it's been it's been a pretty tough run for him ever since. Um, Monte Carlo. So like we talked about it before, like I think we talked about it on the last pod, we talked about Fritz for a while, but I still think that like, he's too good. Like you just run out of guys, man. And like, he's I'm too good. Not... You, led, you left Bublik out of that tier. No, he's in the tier. Oh, he is. Okay. Yeah. He's in the tier. Yeah. Is he towards the bottom? I guess, but it's so close, man. Like you could make an argument like mine. Well, that's why I put them in a tier. Cause you could make arguments for any of these guys above each right, other. Right. Yeah. I just don't see how you can leave Fritz all the way out. Like, I get it, poor run of form, but like, it's not Sitsipas bad. Like, yeah, losing to Fusevitz is bad in Stuttgart, but like, Mackey's pretty tough on the grass and he lost six and six. Like, Man Reno is a legitimate player on the grass, like, and he mm-hmm. lost four and six. And like, you know, like, I, I, yeah, I have a hard time drawing. Like, he's just too good of a tennis player. Like, just as a pure tennis player, he's, and, and there's two, there's, there is a pedigree here on grass versus Sitsipas who, like, all you have is Mallorca. Right. So like that, that's kind of where I'm going with Fritz and why he gets in. Um, I think other than that, it's all the same guys. And then I talk about RBA. RBA, it's like, do you do you think that the past so you know, go uh repeat who's in that that uh that next 10 after uh Fritz, Rebels and Tiafo? Yeah, fruits, Fritz, fruits, Fritz, Sinner, Medvedev, Kachanov, Demonor, Hubie, Bublik, Greeksport, RBA. Okay, so Korda and Zverev. No Korda, no Zverev. Korda, my question is, where are the results? Outside of the beginning of this year when he looked absolutely amazing, where are the results? I can't argue with you there. It's based uh, purely on perceived talent. And the fact that he had a really good run in January. Good point. Um but with Corda, like, okay, so if he played any guy in your next tier, or like, so Corda's in your next tier, right? I'm assuming, right? I left Corda out entirely, like, but really? I can see, like, it, it gets really tough. Like, it gets really, like, he's like, I just ran out of guys pretty much. Like, I, I could have slid, I could have slid Corda in at 20. There's a lot of guys who I could have slid in at 20. 20 was tough for me, but okay. like, it was, um, it was, it got really tough. And I, I left Corda out because like, my question is, it's all like, but I, I get the argument, right? Like Corda's talent, like the perceived talent is there. Yeah. It's just like, where are the results, right? Like Corda on grass, like, is he ever like, what's his best run on grass in his career? Probably Wimbledon fourth round and he lost to Kachanov. And yeah. Like five yeah. seven. Yeah, I mean, and I guess he did beat Demonor that year, so that's pretty good. Um, but like this year, I was not impressed with that run at Queens Club, so that's why I'm like, that's why I guess in the power rankings, like I'm I'm docking because like not docking, but like that's why he's not there because like, but like I personally, if Corda played any guy in my next tier, which is Hubie, Fritz, Dolo, RBA, Paul, I would probably give him a slight. So you left Hubie out. You left Hubie out also. Hubie is in my next tier. Okay, so I so I put Hubie in. Um, okay. I just think with the serve, like, like he can beat guys, you know. Like again, if you're looking at like who's done well in the past, like, and I get that it's it's well in the past, but I don't think his form is that off. Like every match with him is close, which is also a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, I don't know, man. Like he won Holly last year. Semi's a Wimbledon in 21. Like, again, there's some pedigree there on grass. And, yeah, like, there is. 
it, but no, it's hard. I have, just... So I have Greek Spore really high. For me, he's number eight on my list. Number... So I slid him in at 12, but again, like it's all the same tier. It's all the same. So yeah. that's why it's like really hard to argue. You know what I mean? It's like, like I, I can see arguments keep like, and I can see you easily sliding Greek Spore ahead of a lot of these guys. Um, mm -hmm. You had Medvedev in that tier, right? Like, I think at some point you're just too good of a tennis yeah, player. Yeah, Medvedev is number 12, but I mean, he's yeah. low. For me, he's low in that tier. Like, I actually think those other guys have. I get it. I get the argument. It's just at some point you're too good of a tennis player, right? And like, you, I can't leave, drop right. you any further. Exactly. Um, right. Yeah, Fritz for me is the one thing that, like, if I had to argue with your rank, I think the biggest argument I was making is Fritz. And I get the point. But, like, I just think, like, he's he's too good of a tennis player and he's shown enough on grass in his career not to be included with those guys. Um, all right, so RBA, that... well, how you depend on, feel about the injury, Hubie. I, I kind of think on Hubie too. Like, I don't see how I don't see how Hubie can be that far. Well, like, Hubie is the top whole... of my next tier, then that's fine. That's fine, yeah, yeah, because he was closer to the bottom of this tier for me, so it's, it's we're pretty close there. Okay, we're pretty close. Um, RBA is RBA in your next tier, he is, but okay. he's like low in my next tier. So then, who who was in your tier again? So my third tier? Yeah. So Medvedev is the bottom of that second tier. And then for the, the, the next... No, no, no. Who's in your second tier? So again, okay. one more time. So it's Rublev, Tiafo, yep. Kochnov, Dimonor, yep. Sinner, Greek Spore, Boblik, Zverev, Korda, and Medvedev. So it's very interesting one because I was very near the top of my next tier. Okay. Um, he, he wasn't in that tier for me. So um I guess what drives him up, like what drives him into that tier? Um so I think it's you know, his first serve is one of the best in men's tennis. Yeah. Um, and he's able to like if he's getting a lot of first serves in, he's nearly impossible to break. Um, and I think like he has more experience on grass than most of the guys, to be honest, because he's just been on the tour a little bit longer. Uh, we, you know, he used to be the young guy on the blocks. He's not anymore, right? So he's he's played quite a few Wimbledon's. Um. I don't know. I, I thought that that match against Bublik was nearly 50-50. You know, like, Bublik played a tremendous match, right? And, like, yeah, get out of his hand. But yeah. if Bublik doesn't do that, he's in the final, and who knows, against Rublev, right? So it's like, I feel like he's pretty close. Um, also, Zverev has had a lot of good results recently. You know, like, he can also throw in complete duds, right? And just lose, like, like he did against Rude at the French Open. But, like, He's had good results. He's made he's made deep deep tournament runs the you know the last two months, right? So I I can't really dock him for that, you know. Yeah, for me it's just too many duds. But it's as like, too many as duds and not enough. Her, but as tidbit said on her spaces, he either like wins close matches ugly or loses right? terribly, ugly or loses terribly, right? So yeah, uh, it's also like. Yeah, the, the I, I don't know. I, I he don't, he doesn't have as much of a pedigree on grass. Like he did make the finals of Halle a, a while mm -hmm. back, but like other than that, like his grass results really aren't amazing. Um, for how long he's been on it, like they're not great. Um, and so is all these other guys. Like Sinner doesn't really have good results. Like everyone is just a prisoner of that uh, quarterfinal when he was up two sets to love against Novak. Like that's really his only good result on grass, to be for, honest. For me, I, I agree with you. For me, it's more just like he just is a tennis player, he's a really good tennis player, right? Like, like when he when he when he's on, like or not when, when he when he's healthy, he's a good tennis player, and like that's why I have him there. And he has, and it's more because I think he has like the ability. He's the only like his the peak is high enough to put him there, right? But like, but we're we're arguing one tier off, right? Like, and I guess. Yeah, I just want to get your. He's your low thoughts. on that that second tier, and for you, he's he's high on the next tier. So it's, it's yeah. I just think the first serve of Zverev is just really good, and it's just really hard to break when he's making a really high percentage of of first serve. He's just very easy to break when he's not because the second serve. His second serve is atrocious. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so it's like a, it's a, it's a, 
it's an interesting thing. But um, but yeah, see so who's your next tier then? So my next tier is um Hubie, um Fritz, Holger Rune, Monorino, Dolo, Paul, and RBA is my next tier. Okay. So the only guy that you have that I don't, or sorry, the only guy that you have in there that I don't, the only the only difference is you have Dolo in there and I don't, which I get it. Like Dolo for me was in my like list of I guess of honorable mentions. And like I have a list of guys like at 20, I had no idea who to slide. Yeah, I have an honorable mention category as well. Yeah. And my honorable mention category is deep. Um (laughs) but but um and I and Dolo is pretty high up in that. Um but he's in the top five my honorable mention. So it's not far off. Mm-hmm. Um, the guy I have up here is Wolf. Really, I really like Wolf's game on the grass, man. Like, I get it; the results aren't really there, but I just like it gets brutal at this point, and I really like his game on the grass. I like that slice serve. I like the forehand. Um, is Sissy Pass in this tier? No, I Sissy Pass is not my top twenty. He's not like. Is he in your he honorable mentions? Because he's no. not mine either. Wow. Also, like, also for me, in order to be in my honorable mentions, like. You have to have done something to gain honor, right? (laughs) Like, like I didn't put like, like I did the same thing with Nori. Like Nori's probably in the top 25, but he's not in my honorable mention mention list because like, if you're in the top 20 rankings and you don't get into the top 20 of the actual rankings, you don't get honorable mention. Like, it was an exception because he's ranked like 19th. So it's like close. And I guess like, that's kind of what I was looking at with Cerullo. So if he's in the top like nine, and I don't think his ranking is far off for who he is as a player. So if he's like in the bottom of the top 20 as a player, and if grass is his worst service, I think it is, then how can he be in the top 20 of your overall rankings? Or of your grass rankings? Good point. Yeah. Um, but like, yeah. So I actually ended at 19 because I literally couldn't sell. I guess I'll throw a quarter in there at 20 just based on pure perceived talent. But mm-hmm. man, it gets tough. So who's in your honorable mentions list then? Because I guess that, that's it for 20, right? That's 20 for both for both of us. That's 20 for both of us. So uh 20 for me was uh wait, so Dolo RBA Marino. See, I just did like a 21 through 25 kind of category. Okay. Oh, so those guys are Sonigo, Rusavori, Dimitrov. And Nori. Okay. So, like I said, I, I did not... I, Nori was not eligible for my honorable mentions list because he's not okay. honorable. <laughs> um, Fair. I have... And neither is FAA for the same reason. Um, and FAA was kind of in this category. I just don't know where to put him, to be honest, because I don't... I mean, we, we just haven't seen any any of him. Yeah. Um. Curios is a name that I didn't include in my top 20 because uh, he's just been hurt. And I don't have any faith that there's right. anything there. Um, also, I really question anybody who didn't play any warm up tournament for Wimbledon. Djokovic, I get. Like, Djokovic, he, Djokovic gets an exemption from that list because, like, he's Djokovic. Right. And I'm sure he can, like, figure it out during the tournament. Right. But Curios, for me, even though he was a finalist last year, didn't have no, he... in that respect. Um, I actually think he might pull out. To be honest, I could see that too. We'll see. Um, but my my list of guys who are close but not quite: Korda, Dimitrov, mm-hmm. Dolo. Um, I guess I had Sinego in there. Um, Thompson. He was at the very bottom. Like I put him in Zhang at the very bottom. Like, he's in like the dangerous category, but not. He's they're not top twenty, but they're dangerous. Yeah. Right. Um, like they're like they're like. Thompson, like, he would be a threat to beat, like, ADF, who's a seed, right? Like, he would be a threat to beat, like, he'd be a threat probably against Rude, who's a, who's a top five seed. Like, I didn't put Rude in my list anywhere because we just, there's just nothing that we've seen on grass from him ever. But maybe he deserves to be there. Well, I mean, on in uh, Instagram, he was saying how he prepared for Wimbledon on the golf course. Yeah. He thinks golf is like, like grass is for golf, not for tennis. Well, that's my, that's my feeling, too, is, like, if you don't, for great for rude like if you're like if you're not if you're not instagram is a piece of it but if you're not playing a warm-up tournament like right 
especially for him who doesn't have experience on grass, right? Like I understand yeah. with your Federer. It shows me he's just taking the grass season basically off and it, it's like not a, it's not a priority for him, which is fine. Like, right. Um, well, I'm actually, uh, you know, just, a pre like kind of like a tidbit for tomorrow. I'm, I'm actually looking to fade him against locally plus 400. Okay. So yeah. 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 Um, I think Evans is a sneaky pick here. But Evans has commented that he doesn't even want, want to play tennis right now. Like he's like depressed and like like yeah, he's in such a funk. Yeah. You know, if, if he's playing his best, then okay. But yeah, like, you're right. Know. You're right. Um, Fokine's a, a former junior champion here. I don't think it's very meaningful, but like it's kind of an interesting tidbit. I guess. I mean, he's um, just a freaking Pavel Kotov on grass. I mean, it's. I think the honorable mentions are kind of they end at that. You know I think Shelton. Shelton's an interesting guy here. And he has no rally tolerance. I know. Like but I, rally tolerance matters less on grass. You need still need some. Plus Wimbledon is, is slow grass. Yeah. You know, there you know, are more what rallies. What are your on Umber, on Ugo Umber? He's just been so like when you lose like two and four to Peniston, like I, I just can't put you in that list. Like you, you don't even you lost all your honorable characteristics. You don't even deserve to be honorable mention when you lose like that to Peniston. Yeah. Like Mackie, I can't even put Mackie because he did the same shit to uh against Schwartzman. Yeah. You know, so it's like, no. All right. Well, that that I think moves to our next segment quite well. Because I think we're done, we're done with our power rankings. Um, we'll post them up on the Twitter, at least our tiers. Um yeah. but yeah. um all right, wordplay. Wordplay. So, um, we'll start with Mackie. Mackie McDonald. Flat. <laughs> that is too good. That is too good. That, that might end up being the winner of the day. That, that's <laughs> really good. Um, Jordan Thompson. Well, I want to talk a little bit about that. So, he All hits right. a lot of flat balls, but then he can just play a really flat match, too. Well, a really flat period of time, right? Like he just, yeah, yeah. Right, like he did from uh, up what four one in the second set against Dolo to be yeah. four love in the third. It was just yeah. totally flat. So yeah, okay, that's that's good. Uh, what's your next one? Jordan Thompson, Luigi. <laughs> uh, um, Shelton. Erratic. I was gonna go with green. Green? Yeah. Like you know how green green terms like young. Okay. Like, you know, like because yeah. the talent is there. And like I feel like the, the tolerance could develop. Like maybe it won't though, right? Like, but it could. Like I'm seeing a ton of holes where I'm almost like to the point where I think the talent might not develop more than it does. He's just I, I I he he also is not a ten thousand hours kid, right? Like he wasn't a tennis player as a kid. Yeah. Right. So like he's way behind in terms of development. So that's what makes me think like, you know, that that it's, it's that's why I went with green specifically because with him it's even more green than like other young guys. I agree with that. Yeah. Um. Andy Murray. Oof. I would say. This this might not be a popular opinion, but I actually think he's a little bit full of himself right now. I actually think he's better, like he thinks he's better than he is. Like he's exceptionally tough, and I'm not gonna like bash him, and I I, I respect what he's gone through, but like I almost feel like it's it's almost false hype. That's probably the best way to would to describe it, to describe it. Maybe like not not. I don't think a lot of it's his fault. That's why I kind of went each when you said that because like because he's a a British British and because he's a former champion and because of his career success, he gets hyped through the roof, right? He gets hyped way more than he should. But it's false. It's false hype based on where he is now. Like he's. I agree, but like, you know? what is he? What is he going to do? Come out and say like, guys, yeah. like. 
you guys should all right. leave. I suck. Like, you know, like it's, yeah, it's, I, I mean, I think so. I can be mean to him, but I can also be really nice to him because, like, I, I really appreciate how much he loves the game and is like, yeah, playing challengers while Djokovic is winning French Opens, like, knowing that he was there in that position a couple of years ago. And it just, that just takes a lot of like personal pride and just like love for the game, which I really appreciate, you know? So, yeah, like, I also think it's, um, like, I think he he's been put in a position where he kind of is an elder statesman for the game at this point, right? Because, like, especially now with Federer retired and Adal, I think Adal's basically, I, I'm basically calling Adal yeah. retired now. Yeah. Like, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he, if he doesn't come back. B, like, he's going away and, like, barely anybody's even asking him questions. You know what I mean? Like, you know, he's, like, he's he's completely, like, away from the public spec high right now too with the exception like you occasionally see something about like okay yeah, he's, he's like working on his recovery yada yada but like he's not getting he's not at these tournaments getting getting constantly like badgered by the yeah. media like mcmurray is um but yeah so my take is like he's i think he's kind of like taking on like a, a role as an elder statesman of the game because he's like in terms of like career success he's the second guy right now behind Djokovic. yes yeah yeah i mean but I think like just present day, what it's false hype. That's that's probably my the way I would describe him right now. From the media, yeah, the media has put is putting hype into his matches. That I agree with you is, is... it's not really necessary. Like he was winning challengers, right? But then he played a ATP level player, Demonor, right in the first round, just get absolutely absolutely romped. Yeah. You know, yep. so it's like if that match was like, you know, seven, five, seven, six or a competitive three setter, then OK, you can like, you know, convince me that, oh, perhaps he can make a run. But like it just shows like he's beating up on challenger level guys, all power to him. Like that's not easy either. But then when he plays against a perennial top 10, 20 player, it's it's really tough for him. Oh, he's not there right now. Like he's oh, not. He's, he's not, not. Yeah, no. he's not at all. No, I mean he can't. And that that was a bad matchup for him. But like, I mean, he's beating like Kubler three six six three six four. Jordan Thompson right. seven six exactly. six three. Exactly. Like I think he's better than those guys. Um, but I don't think he's like like he wasn't in the top twenty of my power ranks. He wasn't even anywhere close. I don't think he's even in my top 30. Like, I feel like I could find a couple, you know, he'd probably be in the 30 to 40 range. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I agree. So, I agree. Yeah. Um, um, Peratini. Modeling. He does look, I mean, he might be done as a tennis player. Like, a lot of times these guys, they lose it and they don't get it back, you know, and the injuries come in. How old is Berrettini? Because I feel like he was a late, late bloomer, but I could be wrong. It's like mid twenties. Twenty seven. Seven. Yeah, which is like that's not old, but you know, it's yeah. um it's a little bit sad because I'm I'm a bit I'm a fan of him. Like Yeah. But I just I just think he's like I almost feel like he's just not taking as good care of himself and kind of like kind of it's hard to tell, you know what I mean? Because like you're right, the problem is he's hardly playing now. Like he's played one match in the past three months. I know he's constantly hurt. I mean, I I know he had the abdominal thing, which could be a lingering yeah. injury. But like, it also pr- feels like he's prioritizing things off the court. You know, like his Hugo Boss modeling and all this, all this stuff. You know, it's it's similar to Sissy Pass almost. Yeah, know? yeah. Just in a less weird way. But yeah, I mean, he's more. He, well, I just feel like it's a quieter way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Um. But yeah, it's a shame. It's a shame. But like, I mean, yeah. Musetti. Um, probably flair, but no substance. I was gonna say Italian. <laughs> Italian. That's so bad to say, but it's so true. Like a lot of the Italian guys are like that man. Him, Sinego. Bonini was like that. Like, yeah. I mean, there, there's talent. There's some substance there, but there's a lot of flair. Yeah, it's mainly flair. It's not. Flair would be my word for it. I think. I think I would just say flair. I wouldn't. Flair. I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't insult them and say there's no substance. 
I would just say there's a lot of flair. <laughs> but I'll let you go. You, you, you can do a few for me now. <laughs> I, I also feel like he's underpowered on grass. Oh, on grass for sure. Yeah. You know, which, yeah which makes grass, it really yeah. tough for him to win points, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. But sure. uh, yeah. All right. Let's see here. Um, Kyrios. Um, absent. <laughs> I like that. Okay. Uh, Cressy. Bad. <laughs> I can't argue with that. That's good. Uh, yeah, I just think he's not a good tennis. I, mean, I just think I he's not a good tennis player. And he's being figured out. You know, and I think he, like he may not make it back. By the way, like. Or he might just be, he might be a true, like, he might be a true guy where, like, only on indoor hards or something or fast indoor hards is he, like, a viable ATP player. Because I just don't, like. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, Rusavori. Under. Yes. Oh, that was the word I was thinking of. Yeah. <laughs> Under. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Under. <laughs> uh, there was only one right answer there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Christopher O'Connell. This is a tough one. Um. Overhyped by junkies. Like, I think he's like, I mean, I think he is who he is. And it's like, he's like a borderline ATP player. I like, think we've seen like borderline ATP players have some great weeks, right? Or some great like stretches, right? Like Eubanks is in a final, albeit it's a weak drop, like Eubanks is in a final. You know, we saw Karatsev, right? Pop up for a few weeks. We saw, um, you know, like we see this, right? We see where these guys who are like, really lower like not like not amazing pop up and have a, a good runs right and i think o'connell's in that group like i think he's he's like a 50 to 70s guy like like he's he's, he's an atp player but like he's not like he's not i feel like i've backed him a lot this year that's what we get excited like his junkie you get excited about him when he does well but yeah. i feel like now you're seeing the other side where he's actually like Right, you know, he's right. gonna have these bad stretches too. Like, yeah, it's it, it makes him like a little bit hard to read, actually. You know, because like I, I think a lot of these guys fifty through seventy are. You know, like, and where where is O'Connell ranked? He's seventy. Seventy. Like I don't know, like Offner, like 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 Offner, Borges, Kachin, Fusevitz, Altmaier, McDonald, Yaron, Purcell, Emer, Varias. That's sixty to seventy in the rankings. Like all those guys are kind of similar. Like Varias made the fourth round of the French. And yeah. had had a couple good rounds in South America. Otherwise, he's absent. Purcell had that challenger run, but he's losing to Feliciano Lopez. You know, like it's it's like we talk about it quite a bit. How like that's why like qualities of these tournaments is so tough because these are the guys who are in there, and they're like all right. like they're all guys who are good enough to pop up to the top thirty or fifty when they're good, and like the yeah the flip side is not good. It's it's tough. Um. What else? Uh, who else? Uh, have we not discussed? Uh... Sh Chapo. Erratic. The same. Like that. That's never going to change, right? It's never going to change. I mean, I would. I would give him almost the same uh, word that we gave Cressy. Just bad. So I wouldn't, because like he has like he's he's still winning matches here and there. Like he actually like he's like really? like Zhang is playing better than him though. I know. Jin Zhang is playing better. I, I would almost say like wasted talent. Yeah, yeah. He I might be dis like disinterested could be a word too because he appears yeah. he doesn't really appear interested in like winning matches because it seems like his issues are fixable. Like you could become more disciplined. 
Yeah, but you know, like he's not even that like good at hitting like highlight reel shots. It's not like like Alcaraz where he just like wins these crazy ass points, right? It's it's not even like that. It's just like he wants to win points just by bombing balls. It seems like, you know, when he bombs, it's pretty good. Like when he bombs, the problem is he doesn't have the defense that Alcaraz does, right? Like that that's the difference. Like when you're saying the highlight reel wise, like his offensive highlight reel probably looks similar to Alcaraz's. It's just. Alcaraz has a defensive highlight reel that's, that's amazing, and Shapo doesn't have one. Right, that's true. Um, we talked about Monterino earlier. I guess that's pretty much it. Dominic Team on grass. I mean, never was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Never was exactly, and I think he plays Sissy Pass first round of Wimbledon. No, Just... I know, and like you almost can't fade Sissy Pass there because he's gonna win. He'll it's be clean. Like, you know that match is gonna be on like center court, and it's like just like an eyesore of a tennis match. I know. Like yeah. I just don't want to watch that. Oh, it got super hyped. I know. Like, he, he's already yeah. getting hyped. Like, oh, big match, man! Sissy Pass team. And it's like no, like no. No, it's not. I'd almost rather watch like Nakashima against uh Thompson. Oh, that, that that's Austin. that's the match of the first round. It could, yeah, very well could be. But like that match should be on center court more than Sessi <laughs> Boss and uh because I think I think both those guys, Thompson or um uh Nakashima, beat either of those or Sissy Pass or Team. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. So it's it's crazy. Um Arthur Feast. I know I'm higher on him than you are, but I wonder what's the one word that comes to your mind when you think of dinner, Arthur? huh? Dinner. <laughs> in early 2025, I'm gonna get a dinner out of it. <laughs> dinner. <laughs> okay. Well, free dinner for you, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, that's fantastic. All right, I think that that's good. We could end it on that. That was awesome. <laughs> <That one. laughs> so our bet of the day tomorrow is Barrer money line against uh, Tommy Paul. Yep, and we also like we like backing in Reno in some fashion versus Eubanks as well. Okay, so you're um, on the money line. I'm on the minus one and a half. Yeah, but we're both on that match in in some capacity. Okay. Um, uh so say Barrer wins and he plays uh Sarundolo in the final. I don't. I don't even know if he'll get more than a money line on that from the books because there's such a short turnaround. It's only like a three hour turnaround, or it'll only be like an hour turnaround because like they're playing the women's final at twelve thirty, and those guys go on right after. So like if that match between Barrera and um and Paul and not Paul, yeah, Barrera and Paul, if that mm-hmm. ends at like twelve thirty one o'clock, which it probably will, even on a grass, it'll probably be at least an hour and a half, if not two hours. Like if that ends at twelve thirty one o'clock, the books might not get a line out in time. Especially because it's such a weird match, such a weird spot. Like the books, like they, you may even see the books not to decide not to put a line out. It's really weird. Like I wouldn't know where the line should be. I mean, maybe against Paul, it's a little bit closer to a pick em, I guess. Against Barrera, it might be like Dolo minus 145 or minus 150. It's just a weird, but it's right. such a weird spot. Yeah. Like I, like I said, I can see the books not not putting out a line or at best putting out just a, a just a money line and that's it. Oh. Like all I know is I'm gonna be hitting refresh a lot <laughs> on Bovada. Yeah. For that line. But like I mean if we if Dola wins, I mean we have that futures, right? If well, I don't have a futures on Dola. I just had the quarters and that was it. Quarters, okay. Yeah. So yeah, I actually have quite a bit because I have that second quarter to win that the tournament at okay. Uh plus three seventy five. And then I have yeah. to win at fourteen to one, I think. And then I have Monterino at six uh six fifty to one. I can't believe Man Dolo is fourteen to one to win that tournament. I don't know how I failed to hit that. Yeah, I, I'm surprised you didn't. You hit the quarter yeah. at what was the quarter price? Two and a half to one or something. I don't think I maybe it came down by the time I got it. Because I think I got I think I like because you know what it was? I forgot to even look the the futures came up so late for that tournament for Eastbourne. Like they 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 came, they came up after they came up Saturday. I, I didn't hit it. I didn't get the futures while they were still up pre-tournament. 
Mm-hmm. I looked at them like I got them after the first day. And I think after the first day, that price had already tumbled to like 12 or something or 11. Like, okay. And like, but or, or might have been lower. It might have been like, like somewhere like the, like the eight to 11 range. And like, by that time, I was like, okay, there's really no value here anymore. But like at 14, yeah, yeah that's probably a good bet. Yeah. I just like that quarter because you had Sonigo and Sarindolo in that quarter. And I thought that they yeah. were two yeah. players in the draw. But uh, yeah. But now I thought, you know, obviously I thought Fritz would do better. And I guess like, Fritz was a two time champ. So I thought Fritz would do better. Um, yeah. That's probably the biggest thing. You know what I mean? Like I was just, you know, I, was, I just, yeah, I mean, you know, because I, I thought Fritz actually was going to really show up in one win. And, and, may, and I guess I, I think he just didn't play well, but like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's, uh, yeah. Because that wasn't a terrible draw. I think cause it's so close. Like there's no trip. Eastbourne was better than Mallorca. Yeah. Right. But that being said, I, I really enjoy these 250s. Like I really feel like there's a lot of long shot value. Yeah, certain ones. You yeah, know? I agree. Certain ones. And like it just makes it like fun to watch because like I feel like there's a really good shot of cashing in on like a 20 to 30 to one. On it's fun because like these lower guys have like a shot in these 250s. Yeah. And I agree when you even the 500s, like the popular 500s, and and like then, then especially it's like really the hard course. for the lower guys to win. Or even make like good runs. Like right. we did see it in Madrid. But like a lot of times you see like the top guys just dominate when when there's too many of them, man. When the top when the when when like fifteen of the top or like yeah, when fifteen of the top twenty play an event, it's really hard for the lower guys to get a word in. It's really hard. It's really hard. But uh, yeah, I, I'm a fan of the two fifties. I, I I enjoy it. Like I, I before I used to like only like Masters one thousands and slams, but like with the betting, like I enjoy these two fifties just as much. Yeah. I'm you know, on that. It's like it's really fun. It's really yeah, I'm fun. On that. So, all right. So we'll be back tomorrow for a massive uh, Wimbledon pod um, with a special guest who's not yet announced. Yep, but uh, we're excited, and it's it should be it's gonna it's gonna be a long one. So I know Match Point Nine they came out with their pod today. Uh, Bet Rivers they have their pod today. So listen to those first. You get Saturday to listen to those. On Sunday, you're going to be listening to us. <laughs> yeah. And it'll be four hours of pure, pretty much pure Wimbledon talk. Yeah. It's going to be really good. So uh, we're excited. We're excited for the tournament. Um, so thanks again. Stay, we'll, we'll stay active on the Twitter. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll see you tomorrow. Have, have a good night. Guys. Bye, everyone.